Hi guys, welcome to Learning Electronics Repair. This is part three of how to read schematics. In part one and two, which I will link from the end of this video and also in the description, we learned all about the symbols on the schematic diagrams that we're likely to find. So really now, if we think about the symbols as being like letters of an alphabet, we understand the alphabet of schematics. But there's more to it than that. We need to understand how the components are connected together. So in this video, let's have a look at how the lines are drawn on the schematic. These are effectively all the wires and the other information that we can also find on the schematic. So here is a fairly typical schematic. This one actually is an ATX power supply or part of one. We can see here. And you'll see lots of components on here, the symbols that we learned last time and the time before, resistors, capacitors, diodes, MOSFETs, transistors and such like. Let's have a look at the information we have here. So I'll zoom in on this section. Now you can see that the zoom on this PDF doesn't work very well. It's a little bit fuzzy, but it's okay. We can see what we want. So you'll note that the components have two sets of numbers by them. For example, we see D12, FR150, D18, FR150. The D18, D12 and such like, this is the reference for the components. If we look on the PCB, usually we will find this on the silk screen printed on the PCB, so we can identify which component is which. The other numbers, FR150, is the part number, the type of part. So if you wanted to replace D12, you would buy some FR150 diodes. You would look for FR150 at your favourite components and buy it, and that's what you would buy. Here's another one, Luke, IC2, L805CV. Again, IC2 is the component reference, L805CV is the part number. We just one or two more. So we have, for example, R37, 2.7K, R38, 2.7K. I'll just zoom it out a little bit. It'll look a bit better. There we go. We have capacitor C5 says 1X 50 volt. This will actually be one microfarad 50 volt. It's just the way they are showing it on here. This schematic's using a different numbering system. You might see this. So example, C23 says 103. It's not 103, it's 103. And this means 10 followed by three zeros, 10,000 or 10 nanofarads. Here's another one, C19 says 104. That's 10 followed by four zeros or 100,000. That's 100 nanofarads. But on a different schematic, you may see this done differently. Here, for example, we see R37, 2.2K, C97, 1UF. So rather than this 105, 106, this is actually telling you values in different ways. Another one, C1, 0.1UF. That's the same as 100 nanofarads. On the other schematic, that would be marked as 104. So one of the things you need to learn is how these systems work, where they put in the values of resistors and capacitors, for example. The other thing we need to learn is these lettering systems. We have R for resistors, C for capacitor, L5 for what is obviously an inductor, okay? So let's look at these various methods of identifying components on paper. First, let's look at the different methods we may find of marking the value of components, resistors and capacitors in particular. With resistors, we specify the value in ohms. We get resistors generally from a fraction of an ohm to several mega ohms or millions of ohms. So obviously if we were to write the value out in full, for example, a five mega ohm resistor is five million ohms. First of all, there's lots of zeros. It's easy to get confused. You'll miscount them. And secondly, it takes a lot of space. So to get around this problem, we normally specify the value of a resistor either as a number of ohms, a number of kilo ohms, which are 1000 ohms, 
or a number of mega ohms, which are a million ohms. And there's a few different ways we can do that. So we could, for example, have a one ohm resistor, like so, or for example, a 220 ohm resistor, like so. But this is a funny little symbol, and you probably can't find that on your keyboard very easily, that omega symbol. So what normally happens, that gets replaced by a letter R. So we will say 1R, 1 ohm resistor, 220R, 220 ohm resistor. And you would find, for example, something like a 1 kilo ohm resistor, you should just put as 1K, okay, 1K, one, 1 mega ohm resistor, 1M, and so on. Now you will get some values in ohms and kilo ohms and mega ohms that are effectively written with a decimal point. So 2200 ohms is 2.2 kilo ohms. And you will see this on schematics 2.2k, 4.7k, 3.3 mega ohms. That's the second way you will see these specified with decimal points. And because of that, you could see, for example, some low value resistors. So you may have 0.22 of an ohm, 0.22 or 0.22 ohms. So that's the way you often see these specified with the R, the K, or the M. But quite often, you'll find a shortcut on that as well. So what a lot of schematics do to make this smaller, if you like less characters, they will replace the decimal point with the multiplier, K for 1000, M for 1 million, R for 1. And you will see resistors, that one, 2.2K, being marked as 2K2, 4.7K, 4K7. 1K, well, on the same basis, 1K0. Yeah, 1M, 1 mega ohm, 1M0. 3.3 mag, well, I'm pretty sure you're with this now, 3M3. So those are the methods you will generally see resistors marked on a schematic. What about the low value ones? Exactly the same. 0.22 of an ohm, 0R22. You just put the multiplier where the decimal point would be. So that's how you will see resistors generally marked on the schematic. What about capacitors? Well, capacitors are measured in farads. But normally speaking, a farad is a very large amount of capacitance, so you will not come across capacitors of this size on schematics. Probably the largest ones you will find will be millifarads, which are like a thousandth of a farad, but even those are extremely large. Microfarads, or a millionth of a farad, is most likely the highest multiplier you will see. A picofarad is in fact a very small amount of capacitance. A picofarad, PF, is one million millionths. That sounds good. One million millionths of a farad. That's a one to the power of minus 12. Yeah, 11 zeros in front of it. So we actually take pick a farad in our case as being one. One PF. And this will make sense in a moment. When we get up to a thousand pick a farads, we go to the next multiplier, which is nanofarad. Okay, so one nanofarad equals 1000 picofarads. After that, when we get to 1000 nanofarads, we go up again to microfarads. That is a millionth of a farad. This is a thousandth millionth of a farad. Yeah. So one microfarad is in fact 1000 nanofarads. And the last one, not likely to see, is MF and millifarad, which is 1000 microfarads. So that's how the multipliers work with capacitors. 
Again, there's different ways to mark these and you saw some of this on that schematic I was just showing you. So in some cases, you will find values like 10 microfarads or 100 nanofarads, these sort of markings. And you will find them like I was just showing you where they put the value 103. So that is 10 picofarads with three zeros after each equals 10 nanofarads. Okay, this is why we had those markings, 104. This is 10 picofarads with four zeros after each, which is 100,000, 10 with four zeros. I'll draw that to make it clearer. 10 with three zeros, 10,000. 100,000 picofarads is 100 nanofarads. So these are the two markings you will see. You'll also see the 2.2 microfarads, and you may just occasionally come across components marked like 2U2. So that's using the same method the resistor was, replacing the decimal point with the multiplier. Yeah, let's look at 2.2 um, nanofarads. 2.2 nanofarads could be marked as 2N2. Yeah, or it could also be marked as 2, 2, 2. That's 22 picofarads with two zeros after it, which is 2,200 picofarads, which is 2.2 nanofarads. So that's how the system works with resistors and capacitors. You just need to get your head around this. Probably a little bit hard to take in in one go. Somebody probably explained this a lot better than I just did. But that is something you need to learn, how the values are marked on the schematic. Let's look at something a little bit less mind-blowing now. These are the component designator letters, or reference letters if you like. This is where we see on our schematics R102, or 33 these are the reference to the components on the board these letters will give you a good indication of what type of component you have and these are the ones you'll commonly see this is not everything and some manufacturers of boards or of the schematics use different methods but that will give you a good idea so R is a resistor VR is a variable resistor. Quite often a trimmer part or a preset is marked VR also, that's what they usually do with them. We have some slightly less usual ones. Or V is a varistor or MOV, metal oxide varistor. This is a voltage dependent resistor but sometimes you'll see the marked as VDR as well depending on what the person who was making the schematic wanted to do varistor uh, TH see this one sometimes as a thermistor then we have capacitors C capacitor doesn't matter if it's polarized or non-polarized capacitors really are all we see vc variable capacitor that's one you may come across inductors l and closely related to this one t transformer f b Ferrite bead, this is a small inductor usually, in fact always, ferrite bead. Shall we keep going? Why not? F, fuse. SW, or sometimes S, switch. RL, really? Just off my page, let's go over to here where we can see them, yeah. P, plug, TP, what do you think guys, test point, 
JP Jumper J We're using all the combinations here, yeah? J, there's a Jack or a Jack Pug Sticking with the passive components X or XTAL or sometimes Y as a crystal Not so many left now D Diode LED is light emitting diode, so obviously I won't even write it down. ZD and occasionally Z is a Zener. Usually ZD. OP, opto isolator. And then we have transistors. Now, transistor, regardless if it's a MOSFET or if it's a bipolar transistor, on old boards, they were probably marked as TR, and on newer ones as Q. Okay, both of these are a transistor. You cannot tell from the designator if it's a MOSFET or a bipolar transistor or any other type of transistor. That's the ones they use. And the last one are integrated circuits on old schematics IC and on newer ones U. These are an integrated circuit, or I see. There is a myth that U for IC stands for unrepairable. I'll leave you to work out for yourself if that actually is just an urban myth or if there is any truth in it. But that's why they say U for integrated circuit, unrepairable. As to what Q meant, I really don't know. <laughs> There's one other thing I'll mention related to this as well, and that is you'll often find these markings. And I'll explain why. Especially with modern components, you'll have a little chip, for example, like this with six legs on it, and inside it is like a dual MOSFET or a dual transistor. So we'll have effectively like two transistors in one package. We'll draw the lines so that you cross over. And you will find similar things like this, where you have 8-pin devices and you'll have a dual op-amp. So we'll have an op-amp in here, connecting to there, and we'll have another op-amp in here, connected to there, okay? Usually in the schematic, you will find that the two op-amps or the two transistors in the one package are drawn in separate places on the schematic where they fit in the wiring no reference to the fact they're in one package but you will know from the schematic they're part of one package because if this for example is q11 on the motherboard transistor 11 this half of it or the other half depending on how they did it will be called q 11 a and this one will be Q11B. So when you see this, the same reference with A or B, you know it is a dual package. The same with this dual op amp, you have uh, U1A and you have U1B. And if it was a quad op amp, you also have U1C and U1D. So that's the way you will find it marked when there's more than one iteration in an IC. Effectively, logic gates, if you have six logic gates all the same, that could be like U5A down to U5F. Okay, so we know all we need to know really now about the way the components are marked on the schematic. Let's look at how the lines or the wires are drawn. Here is the schematic we were looking at a little bit earlier, the ATX power supply, and you'll see there are lines drawn everywhere. These show the connections between the components. Now, you'll see the lines cross over each other, but sometimes they cross over each other with a dot. Where we see the dot, it means that those two lines connect to each other. So we can see the collector of Q2 here, goes to the emitter of Q1. It also goes to the junction of these two diodes, D5 and D6, one end of this resistor, and to a tap on the coil. So where you see these dots, it means the two lines join. Where you see this, 
they just cross over they do not join there is an old way of doing this which i'll just show you now in case you come across it on old schematics in the old method you would find this so you would have a track coming down and where the track doesn't join to it it would go like that okay you'll see these sort of things that sort of thing that shows the wire is not connected that shows it is connected there for example so that's the old method of doing it and depending on what you're working on if you're working on vintage or retro equipment you may be working with vintage or retro schematics so you should be aware of that method also sometimes on the schematic especially with digital equipment microprocessor microcontroller based equipment you'll have many many lines all heading in the same direction and often these are shown as a bus a data bus so you can see here we have some thick heavy blue lines on this schematic if you look you'll see coming here we have some lines with arrows the arrow actually shows the direction of the data and we have names key power led green key menu and such like we have some coming the other way okay and we have another one here and if we follow these heavy sets of lines you'll see this goes up here it picks up some extra signals here p5.0 da0 and such on which join in look the dot is showing that that is joining the thick line and this thick line is called a buzz this is a data buzz okay so you can see that those signals are coming from this chip and joining the buzz and this goes up here and we can see for example gpio general purpose io zero to seven h data zero to three so there's eight of those and three of those and if you look where this is actually going well you can see we have three plus eight one two three four five six seven eight and three okay that's the signals there and you can see similar here another data buzz with four signals going to the audio up here okay out one out two and this is kind of saying output left output right but it's the same thing basically so these are data buzzes and you will find these on some schematics but there's another way of doing this which was used more as the complexity of these circuits increased and that's to use nets here is a schematic which uses nets or net names again we have the arrows pointing in and out and we'll also see bi-directional arrows like these ones which tells us the signals pass both ways on those and we have lots of names of the net so net plus usb p1 net minus usb p2 and so on just by the names we know this is usb data it's telling us that yeah this is pch or platform control hub data this is going to the pch this is what used to be called the north bridge on a motherboard and you'll see numbers to the side 54 49 49 and so on four these numbers actually tell us which page in the multi-page schematic those signals go to and sometimes you'll see more than one number if the signal is going to various places and not just one place this schematic also uses data buzzes we can see here and this is telling us it's mdb some data buzz or other 0 to 63 so we have 64 bits of data on this one it's going to page 5 also quite nicely on this schematic it's showing us what is on this page the dim slots and the cpu so we know basically what it is and it's telling us here this is ddr3 channel b and this is the type of motherboard this one is showing the, the pch or parts of the pch usb we were just looking at so there's a lot of information on here to help us to understand the schematic and now of course to the part you've all been waiting for we understand the symbols we understand the lines that join them together but how do we read schematics 
Well, there's no one answer to this, but I will give you as much information as I can, and I'm sure this will make a lot of sense to you. First of all, with schematics, there are three types of electronics, if you like, and the three types of electronics have different forms of schematics. And the amount of information we can work out from reading the schematic will vary, and the methods will vary, depending on these main types. So the main types of circuitry are analog and digital. I said there was three types, but I've only written two, and that's because we're going to break them up a little bit. Analog circuitry is basically any circuit where the voltage across the components varies in a free manner. So the voltage can be, for example, if the supply voltage is 12 volts, voltage on there can be anywhere between 0 and 12. If the supply is plus or minus 15, the voltage is anywhere on the circuit could vary between plus 15 and minus 15. This is analog circuitry. These are your radios, your amplifiers, your TV sets, and lots of vintage equipment. And also some current equipment is analog. Also included in analog circuitry is something that may surprise you, which is pulse width modulation. Now you may think, oh, but PWM is done by microcontrollers. Well, yeah, it is these days, but that's just a microcontroller doing what we used to do with analog equipment in the 70s and 80s, yeah? For example, a pulse width modulator. I'll just show you this. What's a pulse width modulator? Well, you probably know it varies the width of the pulses depending on some input conditions, like a power supply needs more power, it monitors the voltage, the voltage goes down, therefore it increases the width of the pulses to the MOSFETs that are driving the power supply. But in actual fact, pulse width modulation is completely analog technology. Just look at this. Op amp, amplifier, very common analog components, plus and minus, out, okay? Out is driving our transistor, which is driving our power supply. Switch mode, okay? Plus and minus is really non-inverting and inverting inputs. On the non-inverting input, we put a sawtooth wave. This is just an oscillator generating an analog waveform, okay? On the other one, non-inverting via a feedback system, we measure the output from our power supply, okay? Resistors, of course, were involved in this as well, but that's what we basically do. Well, look what happens. This is comparing the two voltages. So imagine your feedback voltage is, and I'll get a different color pen, your feedback voltage is at that level, okay? What's happening? Every time we get a sawtooth wave and this input goes above that voltage, on the output we get a pulse, okay? If this voltage increases, because the output voltage increased, so it's now here. Every time the sawtooth goes above that voltage, we get a pulse. But look, the pulse is much narrower. Yeah. Okay. The output voltage goes down. It's now down here somewhere. What's happened to the pulses now? They're much wider. I'll try and draw it that better. There you go. Okay, do you believe me now? Pulse with modulation is an analog technique. It's not a digital technique. It's just the microcontrollers thought they could do it better with software. Okay, so analog circuitry, amplifiers, audio, RF circuits and such like, and pulse with modulators. How about digital circuitry? Well, I said there were three main types. One was analog and the other two are digital or subsets of, but in actual fact I don't count very well because I've just realised now there's four. So under digital we have discrete logic, can't spell it very well, discrete logic. These are your logic gates, AND gates, OR gates, NOR gates and such like, that's discrete logic. 
Did I spell it right the first time? I think I did. Okay, the street logic. Then, broadly speaking, we have microcontroller circuitry or microcontroller controlled devices. And we have microprocessor circuitry and devices. These various classes will affect very much the way the schematic is drawn and how you read the schematic. If you're wondering the difference between the microcontroller and the microprocessor device, well, basically, the microcontroller is a microprocessor, but it also has its built-in memory, its built-in EEPROM, its RAM, if you like, and the various ports that read various inputs and control various outputs. So with your microcontroller, effectively you have in here just a black box if you like. You have various inputs which are monitored, some sort of program which is actually making the decisions and you have some outputs. And that basically is any microcontroller based circuit. Microprocessor, well, with a microprocessor, you would have external ROM or EEPROM, you would have external RAM, volatile memory, and you would have peripheral devices, I.O input output devices all the microcontroller really does is puts all that into one box again the ROM will effectively control what the device does these IO devices can be monitoring various inputs and controlling various outputs and that's basically a microprocessor based device and again this will affect the schematic and how much use it is to you when you're trying to fix stuff Anything really, example, a graphics card, a GPU, is just this. You have your GPU, just a good example. It has RAM. It has ROM, the BIOS. It has inputs and outputs to your PCIe. Uh, and it has outputs to your screen, HDMI or whatever it is. But that really is just that. Yeah, it's just that. So those are the main types of devices you're likely to come across. Of course, you will come across hybrid devices, if you like, as well. So you may have an audio mixer with analog inputs, audio inputs, analog outputs but somewhere in the mix it will have a digital audio processing section which is one of these types so yes you're going to get hybrid devices as well i think that's quite a good example with the mixer so how does this affect the way we read the schematic the way we understand the schematic let's consider how to read schematics in general and then look more specifically at these three types of devices or four types of devices I was just talking about. So a schematic is like a map, if you like. It's a diagram that shows you the circuitry and how it all connects together and all the components that are on there. Reading a schematic as an analogy, it's a bit like reading a map. You have a map of the UK. Now, Say, for example, you wanted to go walking in the countryside or driving in the countryside from point A to point B. Would you look at the map of England and try to understand the whole map of England? Everything, the whole lot, yeah, even including the Welsh. Or would you look at the bit that you're interested in, the bit that's relevant to what you're doing? Well, I'm fairly sure you wouldn't spend hours examining understanding the map of the uk you would look at the part you want to drive or walk in yeah and the same is very true with schematics if you're reading a schematic because you want to repair a device it's probably the most common reason 
don't think you have to read and understand the whole schematic. You don't. What you have to do is identify the part of the schematic that is relevant to the problem you have and understand that part of the schematic. That's the first important thing about reading schematics. Another thing with reading schematics, believe me, a schematic is not a silver bullet. Having a schematic for the device will not necessarily enable you to repair that device. Yes, it can be a help or an assistance, but sometimes you need other information as well. The schematic alone will not enable you to repair that device. To be able to understand a schematic at all, the first thing you really need to do is understand the basic principle of how the device works. If you don't understand how it works, you're not going to understand what the schematic is trying to show you. I mean, the circuit designer, do you think he understood how the device worked, the principle, before he drew the schematic? Yeah, of course he did. And you have to do the same thing. You have to understand how the device works before you can read the schematic. Let me give you a good example of this. A radio receiver, okay? A radio receiver. Most radio receivers, which are analog circuitry, work like this. So you have an antenna coming in. You have an RF amplifier which amplifies this signal, and then you have a mixer. The RF signal feeds into the mixer, and also feeding in, you have an oscillator. This is called a local oscillator. And these two signals produce an output, and the output is the difference between the two frequencies. So the local oscillator is always, let's say, 450 kilohertz higher than the incoming signal. As you change the oscillator frequency, you effectively select an RF frequency 450 kilohertz above it. And this is a basic principle. It's called a super hat receiver. And you'll understand why I'm telling you all this in a minute. Okay. Coming out of the mixer, you have an I. F or intermediate frequency. This is the difference between the two. Quite common, 455 kilohertz. And that frequency will have on it the music, the audio, the speech that you were receiving. This then goes into the IF amp. So this is amplified and then goes into what's called a detector. Debt. <laughs> My friend Debt's just laughing around the corner. <laughs> and coming out of the detector is the AF, the audio frequency. This goes into the AF amplifier and that drives your speaker. Okay? That is how your radio works. Now, if you were to look at the schematic for a radio and not understand this is how it works, you will not read that schematic. You will not understand that schematic. What's all this stuff doing? You have to understand how it works before you can read the schematic. So the first thing, if you're faced with a schematic for some device you're repairing, you have to Google or in other way, look up how does this work? How does a cassette player work? How does a color TV work? How does a radio work? If you don't do that, you'll never understand. Yes, this is work, guys. This is work. And gradually, as you work on more devices, you will already understand how they work. I can draw this out. I know how that works. And because I know how that works, it then enables me, when I look at the schematic, to say, oh, this is the mixer, this is the oscillator, this is the IF stages, and so on. Yeah. So that's the first point to read schematics. You must understand the function of the device. Obvious? Sure. Does everybody think about that? No. 
In addition to understanding how devices work, and I don't know how everything works. I go and Google it, like I'm saying, you guys have to go and Google it to get a basis of what you're doing, what you're working on, okay? The other thing you need to understand is how components work. How does a transistor work? Not like all the electrons and holes and the silicon doping. You need to understand what it does, basically. If I put a positive voltage on the base of an NPN transistor, it will turn on, etc. okay? We also have to understand how components interact with each other. And I'll give you a good example with resistors and capacitors, but this is by no means exhaustive list. It will just give you an idea of what you need to understand about all sorts of components to read schematics properly. So resistors, we know they are valued in ohms and they obey something called ohms law. And you do need to know ohms law. If you don't know this one, you will not get very far. Ohm's law, the relationship between voltage, current and resistance. And some basic formulas. If you want to know the voltage, cover it with your finger or thumb. Voltage equals current times resistance. If you want to know the current, current is voltage divided by resistance. If you want to know the resistance, voltage divided by current. So that's something you need to know. You also have to understand how resistors work together, what they do when they put in series and parallel. There are some basic rules here I can give you some idea. So, for example, on a schematic, if you find a lot of high value resistors in series, something like this, and you'll probably find this in power supplies or anything with a switch mode power supply, Go into the pulse with modulator chip. One meg, one meg, one meg, for example. Those resistors are part of a startup circuit. This will have something like 320 volts on. And from here to ground will be a capacitor. And this is like a basic building block. You need to understand building blocks like this. So high value resistors in series are almost certainly dropping a lot of voltage, high to low, charging a capacitor, and this is effectively a startup or a power circuit for a chip. One other thing on resistors, we talked about high value resistors in series being in startup circuits normally. You'll quite often come across something like this where you have several it can just be one low value resistors going in parallel to ground usually some sort of supply voltage here going to a in fact let's put some here let's put a uh, transistor in let's make it a bit of a circuit okay switch mode power supply something like this yeah Go into some sort of monitoring circuit. Let's use an off amp again. Out. Some voltage on here. If you see this sort of thing, we can use some low value resistors. For example, three 0.22 ohms in parallel. This sort of arrangement is always a current sense. So you'll find circuits where they're monitoring the voltage across low value resistors. You know straight away, or you should do now, those are current sense circuits. And from this type of basic building block, that's how you start to learn to read the schematics, to identify what parts of the circuit are doing. Voltage dividers, this is something else you really need to know about. Because you'll find this all over the place. When you have some voltage from something, and two resistors in series like this going to something else, quite often an op amp, but it could be anything really. Okay. This is a voltage divider. The voltage divider is quite a simple thing to understand, but you do have to know what it is. So when you see a couple of resistors like this in series, voltage divider. It's putting a voltage on here that's some division of the incoming voltage, so that's 10 volts, and these are the same value as each, 10K, 10K. Actually, the voltage there will be half that because they're the same value. 
There's a very quick, easy way to work this out. Basically, what you do is you add the two resistances together. So we'll call this R1, R2. So 10K, let's put some different values on. 10K and 3K, 3.3, that's like a standard value, okay? So if you want to know what the voltage is here, you can do it two ways. You can say, okay, well, 3.3 is roughly a third of 10. So the voltage here will be a third of that, and you'll be right, actually. The other way you can do it, if they're not quite so obvious values as that, let's change them a bit. 4.7K, yeah, it's a bit less than half, isn't it? But the way you work it out is you take 10 and you divide it by the sum of the two, okay, which is eight. Uh, and you multiply it by whichever resistor you want to the voltage across, probably this one to ground, times the value of R2, 3.3K. Shall we see what it is? Well, it's actually 10 volts divided by 8K times 3.3. Yeah, 4.12, a bit less than half, is what we said. Yeah. Sometimes you need to know what the voltage is. Sometimes you can just say, oh, a bit less than half. And then you know that on the other input, if this input voltage goes higher than that one, the output of this op amp will go up towards the supply rail, and if it goes lower than that one, it will go down towards ground or the negative supply rail. So these are the sort of building blocks I'm talking about. Basic stuff like this. I'm not going to do it in depth in this video because it's not the subject of this video, but if you want me to teach this, let me know and we'll have some more lectures, okay? Another good example, fairly simple one, capacitors. Capacitor passes AC blocks DC. Normally speaking, if you have some voltage rail or similar and you have a capacitor going to ground, what this is doing, this is called decoupling. And it's effectively taking the ripple or the AC signal to ground and just smoothing whatever is on here. If we have the other way, so you've got some in and you've got some out. This is called a coupling capacitor. What this does, well, if you had, this is 0 volts and you had some AC waveform up here, that's on a DC offset, so the center of the waveform, say, is 5 volts, it will remove the DC components and coming out of it, you'd have that, yeah on zero, assuming there's a negative supply, by the way, in your device, okay? Otherwise, it can't go below zero. So the main use of capacitors you'll find is for coupling and decoupling, really. The only other one, probably, that they used for is something like this. Resistor, capacitor to ground, and some sort of positive supply, yeah out, go into something or other. Let's have another op amp, why not? When you switch on or when a voltage appears here, maybe some signal turns on, this capacitor will start to charge up via this resistor. The amount of time it takes to charge up will depend A, on the value of the resistor. The higher the resistor, the longer it will take. The value of the capacitor, the larger the capacitor, the longer it will take but gradually the voltage on here will come up, and when that goes above the voltage that's on that one, the op amp will switch. Okay, so this is often used in timing circuits, where you want something to happen a certain amount of time after something else happened. Yeah, like some output from something put a voltage on here, and then this will effectively give you a delay and put the output there. So those are the main use of capacitors, and this is the sort of thing I'm trying to explain about understanding basic circuit building blocks. Much the same applies in power supply type circuitry, DC to DC converters, book regulators, you've heard them called, no doubt, where you have something like this. You need to understand how this works. So we have a MOSFET, some positive supply, 
a controller, pulse width modulator, another MOSFET, given to ground, the two join together, drive a coil, which has capacitors on the output, and this is out. Okay, this is, if you like, V in, in, out. And this effectively is a voltage regulator. This year, pulse with modulator. And these are the building blocks. Now, to understand something like DC to DC converters, there's a number of variations of this. You will find, I'll just give you one other example. Something like this, coil, diode. Capacitor to ground. MOSFET to ground. PWM. This is what's called a boost converter. This actually gives a higher voltage out here than what's coming in. This is used in a PFC or power factor correction circuit. And you need to understand all these different types. A good way to learn something like this is to go and look up on Google something like DC, DC converter, topology. And while you're at it, go and look up for SMPS, topology. And you will find something like this. So this is SMPS dot us i will link this in the video description if i remember i'll try and here we have for example the converter topologies book boost flyback cook sepic and all sorts of other ones okay these are non-isolating converters these are your switch mode isolating converters so if for example you're trying to repair a power supply a switch mode power supply you have the schematic but you don't really understand how it works you could refer to something like this. So what you need to do is find an example that looks basically the same as your power supply. You can see they're all different. If you have something that looks like this, you can say, ah, I have a push-pull power supply. Once you know that, you can then go and Google for how does a push-pull power supply work or how does push-pull SMPS work? And that will give you a lot of information about how it works. This is what I was trying to say. If you don't understand how it works, you will not understand the schematic. Once you do understand how it works, everything is there for you. So that is another method which you will have to employ when you want to learn how to read schematics. Another weapon in your arsenal is this one, which is data sheets. So any ICs on there on the schematic, you will see the part number. But if you don't understand what that IC is doing, again, you will not understand the schematic. But you can go and enter the part number into Google, put the word data sheet, and you will find something like this. Typically, you will get an example circuit, which will probably look very similar to your schematic, in fact. And you will also find a block diagram of what's happening inside the chip if you need that. But probably more importantly is something like this. So here we have a list of all the pins on the chip, FB, feedback, inverting input to the error amplifier. This pin is connected directly to the output of the regulator via resistor divider and sets the output voltage. So with this data sheet, if this is the chip on your schematic and your output voltage is wrong, from this you will be able to determine which pins you should be looking at on your device you should be measuring what's happening on the feedback the chip isn't running there's no output it's not working from this we can see we know where the power comes into the chip does it have power it has power but it's not oscillating we can see where the resistor controls the oscillator maybe the resistor's open circuit so this is how you can start to understand the schematic so guys, data sheets, topologies, very useful things. Let's have a look at an example of a schematic for an analog device. So this is an audio mixer. Normally when you're looking at analog schematics, the input will be to the left hand side. 
of the schematic and the output will be to the right. So this is a convention with schematics analog anyway that the flow of the signal is that way. Okay. This one's no exception. We can see here we have an input, mic and line. We have some transistors, some op amps. And if we look at this, we should be able to find the signal path. So basically, the signal comes in here. Let's say a microphone or music, okay? And you can see that that basically comes in this way through some stages of amplification and into an op amp. After these transistors, well, we have the gain control here. This is your volume control, basically, for that channel. You can see there is an LED here, level setting, if you look at it. This is making some sort of comparison between two signals there and there. Okay, it's driving an output through, look, a voltage divider of resistors. At a certain level, it will switch this transistor on, and that turns effectively this LED on or off. So this is the first things you can just work out from a schematic like this one. Where's the signal go? Well, it also goes through this capacitor, into this op amp, out of this one, to here. Insert. This is where you plug in like an effects device, say an echo machine or something. Or you can just switch it so the insert isn't being used. The signal now comes into here. Look, this is your tone control, low, middle, high. Yeah, you can see them all here. This is actually the low one. Okay, through the tone control, through another op amp. And then it goes out to monitor. So, for example, if your level set LED wasn't working, just looking at this, you can pretty well say for certain, we need to look at the output of this op amp, and we need to look at this part of the circuit. So this is what I'm saying about, we only really need to look at the part of the schematic that we're interested in, okay? So that's an example of just how to read a analog circuit schematic. With digital ones, it's a different matter. Here is a schematic of a typical microcontroller-based device. I know it says microprocessor, but this is a microcontroller. And you'll see there's no signal path with this type of device. This basically is the brains of it, and it has inputs and outputs. So depending what's happening on some inputs, it can control signals on various outputs. And that's really controlled by the program this is running. With a schematic like this, you can't really determine how the device works because without knowing the contents of the program, you don't really know. But what you can say is that we can check for signals on various inputs and outputs. If we knew what the program was, we could say for this sequence of inputs, we should have this output. But without that, we can't. So the only thing we can really do here is, for example, if something isn't working, like the pump, for example, we can say, well, that's controlled by the signal here. So this signal here turns on this thyristor. So this effectively goes high, turns the thyristor on, and turns the pump on. Which means we can check things like the thyristor, these resistors, make sure we don't have an open circuit somewhere. And the same applies in this area. I mean, this is the power coming in. We have some high value resistors, plus a 47 ohm, a diode, a couple of diodes. So this is just dropping down the input mains voltage. This is AC. This device here, TVR, this is a voltage dependent resistor to prevent against voltage spikes, basically. We can see a diode, which rectifies the mains coming in, a capacitor which charges up, a zenith diode which maintains a voltage here, and this goes up to loop VDD, this is the power to the chip and to reset. So I can see just glancing at this, 
This eventually from the 27 volts, it tells us produces a five volt rail, another Zen and more capacitors. So when you first switch on, the five volt will come here through this resistor and it will charge this capacitor going to ground. So we can see that VDD eventually as this capacitor charges, maybe a few seconds, depends on the value of that and this, maybe part of a second, we'll put power on and you can see here, reset. So this is active low, it has a bar over it, okay? So as this comes up, reset goes high. That means the reset function stops working. The processor starts running and starts doing its work. But all we can really see other than that is obviously this is some sort of input. Here again, uh, probably monitoring things on the thermostat, the heater and such like. And that's basically a microcontroller based device. With something like this, if the microcontroller isn't working or isn't sending the right signals at the right time, the chances are there's nothing you can do about it because apart from it getting a scrap one and taking this part off and hoping it works, you can't fix that, okay? This is why it's called you, uh, you whatever, unrepairable, okay? <laughs> but if there's some problem with one of these parts of the circuit, this transistor's obviously switching a relay here that's doing something, water tank illuminator then you can work on those parts of the circuit so the schematic will help you when we come to microprocessor based stuff it gets even worse here is a motherboard a gigabyte a sniper 5 or g1 sniper okay now this gives us a block diagram so we can see how effectively Everything is connected up. The DDR RAM goes direct to the processor. Uh, PCI Express, these are your PCI slots connecting directly to the processor. Uh, some of them go into the PCH platform control hub. Various other things connecting here, the LAN, SATA, and so on. The 3D sound, I.O. port. So you can see how this is effectively made up. And you can see various parts of the circuit. So yeah, we have a schematic, okay, with lots of signals on. But can we use this to repair a motherboard if it won't start? Probably not. And the reason is you need to understand how the motherboard starts up. And this schematic won't tell you that. So with a motherboard or a graphics card, another perfectly good example of this, you will have a power on sequence. So power rails have to come up in a certain order. And this is quite complex. This will involve communication between the PCH, the LPC, this is your super IO if you like. Those two chips together, probably with the clock generator chip and the circuitry that is generating all the voltages for this which is not shown on here, to power things up one after another in the right sequence and make sure that each power rail comes up and is stable before the next one. All of that you need to understand to be able to repair the motherboard if it won't start. And therefore, you need to know the power on sequence for that chipset. You can Google it and maybe you will find it. And if you can find that information, then you will know which signals to look at. So you'll know where it starts, what happens first, what happens next. A power on sequence looks something like this. And guess where I found it? On my channel, of course. So this is for an H81 chipset for a particular motherboard. And this will apply for all motherboards with this chipset, but it won't apply for all motherboards with other chipsets. So we can see if we look at this, we have a sequence of numbers, one, two, three, four, and so on. And this is telling us what happens. So when we plug in from the ATX power supply, we have five volts standby. Okay, you can see that goes through a FET and generates another voltage, five volt dual, through another FET, generates another voltage, three volts dual, 
and eventually generates this signal, RSM, RST, okay? And PCH, uh, D power, okay? So these signals are generated because all of these voltages are present, okay? Once that happens, it sends a signal to the super IO, you can see here. It also sends another signal, sleep signal, and so on. So you can see what actually happens if you look at this. You can watch my video, this one, it will tell you what's happening here. But basically, to understand, or rather to be able to use the schematic for this, you need this. You can see after six, next thing happens is seven, somebody presses the power button. After they press the power button, this chip sends a signal back. Power button pressed, okay? And then wherever step nine is, it's on here somewhere, yeah. It sends a signal to the power supply, ATX power. So the power supply powers up and sends a signal back, power okay. This is what you would need to be able to use the schematic to repair this motherboard. Without this information, well, the schematic's not really any use to you. And guys, I did say at the start of these three videos, I would teach you how to read schematics. Now, I hope you can see that reading schematics is quite hard work. To learn to do this, you have to put the effort in. To understand a schematic, you need to understand the function of the device at a general level. If you don't, you will never understand the schematic. Even if you understand the function of the device with this sort of microprocessor based system then you probably still can't repair the device using the schematic because you don't have the other information you need the power on sequence for example if the motherboard won't boot up so you can see that a a schematic is not a silver bullet b reading different types of schematics will give you different sort of information and you do it in different ways and three that the schematic alone is often not all that you need, especially with this complex digital equipment. Okay, so I do hope you believe I did teach you how to read schematics, but as you can see, the hard work is now yours to do. I've given you the method, I've told you how to do it, but I can't do it for you. Yeah, you have to go and apply that now. But having said that, I think we will have a part four. So what I'm going to do now, and only you guys who watch this through to the end will know this, okay? I'm going to make one more video, maybe 60 minutes, depending what. So I'd like some of you guys to go away and submit some schematics to me. I want a mixture of analog, microprocessor, and microcontroller-based circuitry, and just send some to me. I need to know what the schematic basically belongs to, yeah? Unless you really want to challenge me and let me see if I can work it out. So send me some schematics. You can email them to me. I'll put the address on the screen now, okay? So email me some schematics and then I will look at those. I shall select some, possibly the ones I like the look of most, yeah? And we'll do them on video. We'll just have a look and I'll tell you what I see in that schematic and how and why I see it. And then I think really you guys will be able to get off on your own and do this. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you send me something I will select and I will definitely say who sent the schematic in. Yeah, your username, your subscriber name. So hope to hear from you guys. I hope you did enjoy that. Get to the comments anyway. Let me know what you think about these videos. And I look forward to seeing you all soon on another Learning Electronics Repair video. Ciao for now, guys.